It's Parm King, and I'm super excited to bring to you another guide to Curse of Strahd. This one is the Vakter House in the village of Velaki. Now, before we get started, a huge shout out to my Patreon supporters. It's your support that allows me to put these detailed video guides together, as well as the Foundry Adventure modules. That's right, everything you're going to be seeing here in this video guide is also available in a Foundry Adventure module. You can install into the Foundry Virtual Tabletop System and enjoy this session, this game session. So, big thank you to you. Now, if you're interested in becoming a Patreon member, you can by going to patreon.com forward slash parm king or visit the link in the description down below now special three shout outs of course dm andy who's been making the battle maps for curse of strahd and gracious enough to allow those us to include them here in our modules now if you like his battle maps he makes them in grid non-grid day night all kinds of weather effects visit his patreon there's a link down below to dm andy's patreon check those out also, special huge shout out to James RPG Art. He makes these gorgeous matte paintings, both in high resolution and animation. He too is gracious enough to allow us to use a WebP version of his static ones for our Foundry modules. We'll be showing that here today. Highly recommend his animated ones are gorgeous. There's a link to James RPG Art uh, Patreon down below. So whether you're playing on tabletop, Rule 20 Foundry, you should definitely check those out. And last but not at least it's Blair and Seam Packer module. If it wasn't for Blair, we wouldn't have these modules, these adventure modules. He's helped me tremendously putting these together. If you want to create your own adventure module and share it with the community, visit out Blair's Patreon page in the Seam Packer module for Foundry. So with that, let's jump into this particular module. We're going to start with this opening scene. This is the James RPG art. This is a WebP version static image. I like to start my sessions or somewhere in my session with these images because it pulls everybody into the scene. It sets the atmosphere and the tone and the James RPG art images do a wonderful job. Now in Foundry, what I'm doing is I create theater of the mind maps. What that is, is I put a line around the image. I've got a glass wall in there and that allows me just to drag and drop characters right into here so the players can start off outside the manor. We can jump right into role playing. There's no animation in here. I did put a lighting effect in here, some ghost lighting. It makes it gives a little bit of atmosphere, but definitely go check out those James RPG animated versions of this where the birds are flying and the lights are flickering. It's they're really, really cool. So let's talk a little bit about the Valker House. Before I jump into the battle maps and going through this, I think it's really important us fleshing out who are the Vokter family? Who is Lady Vokter? What's going on? In the rules written from the Curse of Strahd guide, this must be an important location. Curse of Strahd doesn't have very many maps, but they do have a map of the Vokter house. And that means to me, Wizards of the Coast thought this was an important enough location to put a map in there. And there's a bunch of stuff in there, but it just seems like they create more questions than answers. Now, I feel as a DM that it's important to flesh out some backstory, some lore, to provide context for your players to feel like they're getting further pulled and emerged into the world of Barovia. And the Vokter House is one of these places that has a bunch of nuggets of great things in it, but it, they're relying on us, the DM, to fill in what those things are. So I'll give you an example. What's going on with the cult in Lady Vokter's basement? Why is her husband, who's been dead in this spell, in this gentle repose, just waiting there not decaying? Why did her daughter go mad? Why is there a chest of bones in her closet? What's in the secret room? Um, all of these things don't really have good answers or solid detail enough answers to, to give contents, to give motive and, and means and, and explanation uh, of what is going on here. And that's what I'm going to spend a little bit of time on in the beginning of this video guide is to lay the kind of the foundation, the story behind the Vokter family, what's going on in here. So I have these notes in here and I'll just open up the first one and we'll talk a little bit about the Vokter family. Who is the Vokter family? Why are they a, a powerful family? Where do they come from? What's going on? Well, first of all, we have to jump back in time to learn about the Vokter family. In the rules that are written, there's a couple names that are mentioned, but not a lot of things is flushed out. One is Lavina Vokter. Now, Lavina, 
uh, is the matrix. She's the one that brought the family to nobility. And all of this stuff that I'm bringing together is stuff that I've either made up, bits and pieces that I've taken out of the novel. I strawed some stuff from rules as written and some ideas that I found floating around throughout the Reddit and woven it all together into this kind of narrative backstory that gives purpose and meaning to the family and it helps you as the dungeon master play these characters and know their motivations behind it. So the the family was uh, a wealthy merchant family, the Vokter family in uh, in the village of Velaki at the time that Strahd came to power. And Lavona of Vokter, the oldest daughter of the family, she took on and had a lover named Leo. Now Leo's bones are mentioned uh, in the chest uh, that are hidden in Lady Vokter's master bedroom. Why are the bones of Leo in there? Well, Leo is the bastard brother of Strahd. Strahd's father had an affair with a Vistani woman in the uh, Vistani camp at the Tesser Pools. That Vistani clan in the Tesser Pools are related uh, to Strahd through his bastard brother. His bastard brother, Leo, was also best friends with Sergei Strahd's brother, Sergei. They would often go hunting together. Leo was often called Leo the Brave, Leo the Lion, Leo the Foolishly Brave. He would charge forth and never, without any concern, into harm's way as he went hunting with Sergei. They became very close friends. Well, Leo discovered Strahd's love for Tatiana. Tatiana is Sergei's fiance, and she's a, a major story thread with Irina in our story. And Leo, being good friends with Sergei, wanted to found out that Strahd was going to interfere with this marriage, interfere with this relationship, try to break up Sergei somehow and steal Tatiana for himself. So Leo decided, without thinking, I'm going to stop this and attempted to try to capture Strahd and failed miserably. He did not realize how powerful Strahd was. And so he barely managed to escape Ravenloft and he ran to Velaki into his lover's arms, Lavina Vokter. Now, Lavina Vokter is from a wealthy merchant family. And the real reason that she's dating Leo is because she has this you know, ambition and, and desire to become part of the noble court of Ravenloft. She looks up to the von Zarovich family. She wants to be nobility. She wants to be a princess. But she's just from a wealthy merchant family. She has no royal blood. But she sees and spies her opportunity when Leo comes to her and confides and confesses to her what he tried to do to Strahd. She decides this is her opportunity and she reaches out to Strahd. And tells Strahd, Leo is here. He's confessed to me what he's tried to do, to try to stop you from interfering with Sergei and Tatiana. Now, Strahd realizes that Lavina Vokter, what she wants is to become part of the royal court. And so he offers the deal that she can't refuse. She instructs uh, Lavina to murder her lover, Leo. And so she poisons him. Strahd gives her some poison. She poisons Leo, her lover, and then brings the body to Ravenloft to prove to Strahd that she did this. And in return, Strahd makes Lavina Walker a member of the royal court, a minor noble of Velaki. Now, he strips the flesh from the bones of, of Leo. He, he hates his bastard brother. And he puts these bones in a chest. And he gives them to uh, Lavina Vokker in, in a perverted way in order for her to be absolutely loyal to Strahd. See, the bones do two things. First of all, the bones are a reminder to her and for her family ever after of what she did, the crime she committed based on her ambition and desire to become noble. So they're a, a constant reminder uh, to her. Secondly, he uses this as a form of manipulation. He tells her to keep these bones, protect them for generations to come. And as long as these bones are protected, I will, Lord Strahd and Ravenloft, make sure that you are protected by the royal court. It is a way to, to mentally uh, connect her and her loyalty to Ravenloft. The only people that know the truth of what happened to Leo is Lavona Walker and Strahd. And so she keeps these bones in her house 
uh, and it's passed down from generation to generation to generation. And it is the key, the single item that they have to protect in a representation of what that family did to become a minor noble house. So these bones are hidden in the house. This explains why these bones are hidden in the house and who these bones belong to. In fact, there's an entire book that you can find in the library here about the story that I just told you that the, the, the players can find. Now, we're moving to modern times. It's generations later. And what has happened to the Vachter family when Livona... Uh, ruled the family, she secretly was very powerful in Velaki. Even though the Velakovich family, the Burgermeister's family, ruled Barovia, she, I mean, ruled Velaki, she kind of secretly ruled Velaki. And she realized that she needed to get people loyal to her and pledged to her, so she started this cult. She made up this cult in order to, to win favor from individuals uh, and villagers in Velaki that would uh, do her bidding, spy and keep things in check for her, building her own kind of army of minions in this cult that met in the basement of the manor that she built in Velaki. Today, it's Lady Fiona Walker, the great, 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 great granddaughter of, of uh, Levina. And the family is kind of, over generations, have, have kind of lost their luster. The, the manor is becoming slightly decrepit at this point. The Velakovich family, which are the Burgermeister family that have been ruling Velaki for generations as well, have become more emboldened, more uh, powerful. Um, they have Isaac and the town guard now. They're, they're kind of um, flaunting their power. They're, they're, um, you know, they're disillusioned and they give no respect to Strahd, these, these festivals and stuff like that. In Lavona Walker, uh, Fiona Walker today realizes that her power, her family is losing its its appeal. She needs to do something right now, but she has her own family problems. There are some family issues going on now. The way the the Walker family is, it's a matriarchal family since since uh, the beginning when when uh, Lavina. Uh, became a minor noble, she married somebody. She picked the best suitable mate so she could birth a daughter and hand down the Vakar line. It would be a matriarchal family for, for generations, and it is to this day. So when uh, Fiona Vakar, who is now the matriarch of the family, she's chosen a mate, found the best male candidate in the village, married him to birth some children. Unfortunately, her first two child were male, uh, Nikolai and Carl Walker. In there's no value in the male heirs. There's only value in the female heirs. And so she has very little love for her sons. They live in the house, but they are kind of trust fund kids. They go around town, they get drunk, they cause some mischief in town. And she cares not for her sons. She has no love for her sons. The only things she cares about is that they carry the family name. So if anything happens to her sons, she'll, she'll totally retaliate not because of love out of her sons, but it's an affront to the family name. Um, the only person that Lady Fiona Walker today cares about is her daughter, Stella. See, Stella got to that age now where the mother, Fiona Walker, has started to groom her into the ways of the dark magic to lead the cult, the true history of their family and their relationship to Strahd and Ravenloft. And Stella, the young daughter, was mortified. She has not a single bad bone in her body. To learn that her mother is practicing this, this dark witchcraft, leading this cult, has this secret relationship with Ravenloft and Strahd and, and, and you know, worships the dark side of things, she, she refused. She refused to follow in her mother's footstep, and she ran to her father who loved her dearly and said, mother is, is, is doing all these horrible things. I don't want to do them. She's trying to make me do them. Uh, Lady Fiona Walker was furious. And so she poisons her husband, who's, who, who stood up for the daughter. This husband stands up for the daughter, Stella, and says, you're not going to do this to the daughter. I'll protect her. And Fiona says, this is a matriarchal family. I am the power in this family. You're lucky that I chose you to be my husband. And so she poisons her husband, murdering her husband. And the act of murdering, not to mention finding out that her mother was this dark magic user with this cult and, and, and in a league with Strahd, broke Stella. 
sent her into madness. She couldn't deal with the reality that the mother she thought was this great mother who loved her dearly was really this kind of secret, dark person with all these things in her past. And the fact that she murdered her father, who she loved, just broke her. So Stella went crazy. So Fiona Walker has locked Stella in her room, and she's cast this spell on her dead husband, gentle repose, so he doesn't deteriorate. And this is what Lady Walker's dilemma. If she restores uh, her daughter Stella and gets rid of this madness, will Stella embrace her destiny to rule and learn to rule by her mother's side, learn the ways of dark magic, lead the cult forward, uh, uh, carry on the Walker family tradition? Or will she continue to refuse? Lady Walker sees her husband, who is technically dead, but she has the possibility of bringing him back to life, and she's cast this spell, kind of putting him in suspended animation as the carrot and the stick. See, if if Stella, if she lifts the, 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 the madness from Stella and still embraces her destiny and learns the dark magic and... Uh, becomes the leader of the call and leads, you know, becomes a leader with her mother in this way, she'll bring back the, the, the husband as a gift to the daughter saying, I know you loved your father and it's fine and he's going to be okay. So it's a reward. If, however, Stella comes back and she refuses to partake in these dark, dark ways, then the mother can use the, uh, the, the dying father in this suspended animation to say, well, you know what? If you don't do what I say, I will permanently kill him, and he'll never be able to come back. So he, she's using this body in her mind as this carrot of stick, and so she's waiting for the right time to uh, cure uh, Stella of her madness. And she has the ability to do so. She just needs to find, when she is cured, how do I convince her of her destiny to, to take up the, the traditional matriarchal uh, line? She is the heir to the family. So this is the personal dilemma that's happening now. The, everybody in, in Velaki, including the servants, including the two uh, sons, believe that the father is just ill. He's in his deathbed dying. They don't know that he's been poisoned, that he's dead. Lady Valker does not let anybody into that bedroom. She says, I have to go and take care of them. And, you know, he's slowly dying. The two, two Yawker, uh, Valker boys don't care. They're, they're out there drinking. They know they're not loved. Um, and they think Stella has gone crazy or mad or upset because her father, who she desperately loved, is dying. So that's the story. The servants believe that everybody in Velaki that knows anything thinks that old man Valker is in his deathbed, dying, and he's very ill, and Lady Valker is at his side. That's the story that's playing out there. Now, there's a power struggle going on, which you've read, Rules has written. The, the Burgermeister who rules the village rules it with an iron hand in these silly festivals. And he's kind of, uh, you know, um, being belligerent in a sort of way to Strahd. And, and the Valker family is losing their power. But Lady Valker sees this as a golden opportunity. The Valker family has been in decline for centuries. And she sees... Uh, and she's noticed that the town is the town and villagers are starting to resent the burgermeister, right? They hate these festivals, but they do fear him. And she sees that the 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 morale and the mood of the town is is slowly boiling and moving against the burgermeisters. And so she says, this is an opportunity to put the Valker family on top again and finally dispose of the Volakovich family, the burgermeister's family in Maybe the Valker family can actually come out and rule Velaki. She sees this as the golden opportunity. And so she has been secretly raising an army. She's, she's mustering her forces in her cult, and she's raising this skeleton army, which I'll talk about here later in the video, to overthrow uh, Velaki. Now, she has two important allies. She has um, Ernst here. Let me get Ernst. There's Ernst. And she has another ally is Halleck. Now, Ernst is Lady Valker's spy. He lives uh, in the module streets of Velaki next to Vasily, and he's a spy. He, he's keeping a pulse on what's going on in Velaki, all the shopkeepers and what's going on in the pubs, travelers, what's going on with the Burgermeister. And she report, he reports back to Lady Valker. He comes to the manor and hangs out in the den and speaks with her. And... Ernst is kind of this sleazy guy. 
He is passionately loyal to Lady Valker. He doesn't have any fantasies that she will love him, but she, he knows that she's powerful. She accepts him for who he is, and he knows that eventually she will take power in Valaki. He wants to be by her side. He's passionately loyal to her in, in, in a very kind of perverted way. Now, Halleck over here is Lady uh, Valker's valet, servant, head butler. He runs the house. He runs the servants in the house. He makes sure that the Valker boys, the two boys, don't get in too much trouble. He, leave, he, he runs the, the servants with an iron fist. And he is also passionately loyal to her. In fact, in his mind, he believes he should be Lady Valker's husband and rule uh, Valaki side by side, but that's not happening. He's just a servant. And Halleck doesn't like Ernst. He is jealous of Ernst. Ernst comes to the manor, sits in the den, and asks Halleck to get him some wine. And so there's this, this animosity that Halleck has towards Ernst. But Ernst is not allowed upstairs in the manor. Halleck is. Halleck goes upstairs. He's allowed in the library. And he is the only person, other than Lady Walker, knows, knows that old man Walker is dead, that Lady Walker poisoned him, and knows why Stella's crazy. Lady Valker has brought him into that inner family circle. So anything that's going on in the Vlaki house and within the cult, that's, that's Halleck. Anything that's going on in the village of Barovia, that's Ernst. Now, I imagine Lady Valker is probably the most intelligent, politically manipulative, powerful game player, social manipulator, social engineer in all of Vlaki. She is wickedly smart very manipulative and realizes what she's doing. So she needs to keep Ernst on her side and enough so that he doesn't, you know, betray her. But at the same time, she knows that Halleck likes her too. So he, she brings him into the inner circle about what's going on in there. So she's playing both of them. She knows she doesn't, never going to have a relationship with these two guys. She's just using them. She's manipulating them. And they both have this weird kind of passionate loyalty love for her. And so she's using that. She knows that I got to keep Halleck, Halleck close to me and allow him upstairs and into these secrets so he doesn't get too upset with Ernst. And I got to keep and Ernst, give him the freedom of maybe hanging out in the den and having some wine and dinner with me. So he remains loyal and continues to give me information. So she's playing both of these guys. It is interesting to note that Ernst is a member of the cult, but he's just a follower. He's not a big believer in the cult, whereas Halleck is actually a huge believer in the cult, and he's one of the leaders of the cult, and we'll get to that later. So that kind of sums up the Vacher family, where they came from, uh, her motivation, the problems with the daughter and the, and the dead husband, her two allies, and her position against the Burgermeister's family and why she has this ambition to go ahead and, and take over. So let's go ahead and jump in here. We'll talk about the, the cult when we get to the cult and also the big skeleton combat encounter that kind of wraps up this session. So we're going to start with the first floor. We're here in this gorgeous map again by DM Andy of the first floor of the manor. And we're going to go through here and talk about several different sections. So this is the entrance of the manor, and they will be answered. The door will be answered, of course, by Halleck here. Halleck will greet. He's the master of the house. Even though he's the head servant and valet, he is the master of the house. So if anybody comes to the house, he will greet them here at the front door and most likely take them to the parlor right here uh, for them to wait for to meet with Lady Valker or into the dining room here for them to sit if they're going to have dinner. He is always hovering. If there's any any of the party members or players, he's within inner shot or eye shot of Lady Valker, and he will protect her with his life. He is fiercely in love and loyal to, to her. Now let's talk about the kitchen. We have the cook here in the kitchen. The kitchen is immaculate because uh, Halleck rules with an iron fist. He expects that kitchen to be clean. And the cook here, Davit, is also a member of the cult. He's just a cult member here. There's something interesting here uh, in, in the kitchen is the storage room up here. And I wanted to point this out, which normally wouldn't seem that important, but with the storyline here, um, is there are three barrels of wine here. You can see them right here, and they have wizards of wines written on them, uh, the dragon crush. Now, 
this storage room has these three barrels of wine, and why are they important? Well, they tie in to two different stories and quests. If you're, if you're doing the, the stockyard murder mystery, you're going to realize that the Vistani are stealing wine from the, the stockyard, selling it to Ernst. Ernst is buying these barrels of wine, and he's giving them the wine to Lady Valker. It's, he's trying to, to be, buy into his, her, her good graciousness. Um, in addition, the Martikoff family that own the Blue Water Inn and the extension of their family, which also owns the Wizards of Wine, are missing wine. Well, here's three barrels of that missing wine. It's being stolen by the, um, by the Vistani in Velaki. The Vistani have been stealing this wine uh, from the, the stockyard and selling it to Ernst. Now, why is this unusual? Well, these are barrels of wine, and the only people that are to have barrels of wine are the tap rooms and the taverns. Barrels of wine are not sold to any of the families. They are delivered to the tap rooms, the tap room at the Blue Water Inn, or the tavern at the Black Water Tavern to serve the guests. Uh, families buy bottles of wines or cases of bottles of wine. So when the players stumble upon this, this ties into the murder quest in Ernst with the Vistani of Velaki uh, in the stockyard. It also ties into the quest of the missing wine and with the Martikoff family. Players can use this knowledge maybe to try to blackmail Ernst or trying to win over the patronage of the Martikoff family. So having these, these barrels of wine here is a nice way to tie in some threads to two other quests and stories that are going on here in Velaki. Now, if we come to the back of the house, this, this back area here is the servant's, uh, the servant's entrance into the back, and the servant entrance obviously goes to the door to the, the storage room with the wine. There's the servant's quarters over here. We'll talk about that in a second. And then there's also the servant's closet here. This is the servants keep their apron and boots, some cleaning supplies. Well, there's a secret door in the back of the servants closet and that takes them down into the cellar where the cult meets and has some cult ceremonies. And we'll talk about that in a second. If we go back to the servants quarters over here, let's just talk about the servants quarters very quickly. There are uh, four servants in the house. There's the cook, Davit, there's the two maids, and there's Halleck, the valet. Now, Halleck is the master of the house. He runs the servants. He's the valet, the butler, and he, he runs the house. They are all members of the cult. Uh, the two maids and the cook are just followers. They're disciples of the cult. And then uh, Halleck is one of the secret leaders of the cult. Now, they all wear masks in the cult, so nobody knows who's the leaders and who are the followers. So the servants don't know that Halleck is a leader in the cult. They think maybe he's just another follower uh, in there. The only person that's known within the cult members is Lady uh, Valker herself. She is a, a significant, she's the matriarch, not only of the family, she's the matriarch of the cult as well. So this is their quarters. There's nothing too much of interest. And that pretty much covers the first floor. Oh, no, it doesn't. We got a really important room here, the den. So let's talk about the den here. Now the den, it's right next to the parlor. The door is closed to the den, you can see. And this is the room that if you were to happen to find Ernst here uh, in the den, he would be hanging out in the den and drinking wine. This is the only room that Halleck doesn't really come into. So if the door is closed here and Ernst is in here, Halleck doesn't like Ernst. If he's in there by himself, Halleck will never go in there. He'll let Ernst fend for themselves. This is where Lady Valker comes to meet with Ernst to talk about what's going on within Velaki. You remember Ernst is the spy. So anything going on in town, this is where she meets with him in here. And he's usually in here, if he's in the manor, enjoying some of the wine that he's actually purchased, the stolen wine he's purchased from Vistani here. Now there's something interesting about this room is there's a urn right up here. You can see it on the map, the battle map. It's sitting right here. And I actually made it an item that you can give to the players. And what's important about this urn is this urn holds the ashes 
of Lavina Walker, the, the, the one that started the, the, the whole Walker nobility line. It's her ashes. And this urn with her ashes is Lady Walker's, Lady Fiona Walker's most prized possession. It represents the only person in her life that she admires, that she looks up to, is her great, 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 great grandmother that started this nobility that was willing to sacrifice her lover to change the course of the family events. Now, it just has sentimental, important value to Lady Valker, so it has no real price to it, but it is her most prized possession. And there's some kind of little sick thing that I wanted to introduce here. See, when Lady Valker comes into this den and hangs out in this den by herself, she goes over the, to that urn and she sticks her hand in the urn and she pulls out some of the ashes of her ancestor and rubs it in her finger, almost in this kind of osmosis way that she could possess some of the ambitious and ruthless power of her ancestor willing to do what is necessary to make the, the Falker family rule. And as she's rubbing this, this ash in her hand, pondering both the past and contemplating her future, so this is like a little weird private ritual she does going in there, reaching in, grabbing the ash and rubbing in her fingers and thinking, what would, what would uh, uh, Lavina Walker do now, you know, to make sure to ensure the Walker family lie, you know? So that's her kind of weird, ruthless ritual that she does with this urn. I just thought I'd throw that in there as kind of some kind of sick, twisted thing that Lady Walker would do. So that's, that, that kind of handles the downstairs. The outside has the outside entrance that goes down to the cellar. We'll cover that next. Now we'll talk about the second floor. And there's a lot of stuff going on up here too. Now, the two kind of what I would call dead rooms up here that have really no interest are the two Valker boys' room, Nikolai and Karl Valker. Uh, they have a room up here, and there's a room over here. These two bedrooms that are empty, there's not much in there. There's a bed, a uh, table, a wardrobe, a footlocker. And the reason for it is the Valker boys are out drinking. They're out skylarking and screwing around, and, and they, they're, they know their mother doesn't love them. They don't even like being in their manor. They know that everything's going to go to Stella, the daughter. And so this is just a bedroom for them, and that's it. There's nothing of interest in there. There's a small chance, maybe a 20% chance, you could probably roll you know, a, a D20 or 1D4 and come up with a probability of a maid in there cleaning up and making the bed. But I would probably run it that the, the two Valker boys will never be in the room when, when, the, when the party's there. Now, let's talk about the master bedroom. This is old man Valker. He's dead. He's laying on the bed here. I actually made him a character. And, and what will happen here with old man uh, Valker is he's deceased. And he's in this spell, this gentle repose spell. So he's kind of in suspended animation. He's not decaying, but he's been poisoned. If the players investigate him, They'll find out that he has, he is poisoned, but there's a spell being cast upon him so he doesn't die. Now, unless they l realize what's actually happened, they may come to the conclusion that Lady Valkers cast this spell or someone's cast this spell because she loves him so dearly that she does she's going to try to find a way to save him. Lady Valker can save him. She's just deciding not to yet. She's using him as this carrot or stick, depending on if she can convince Stella to take up her destiny along her side to rule this fact family Valker. Now, if you wake Nikolai Valker uh, and bring him back, he will come back as a zombie and begin to attack. So I've made his stat block, uh, you know, uh, undead fortitude with slam attack. He technically has the stats of a, of a zombie. So if you do bring him back, you know, you're going to have a little combat encounter here. Now, there's, there's this closet, and you can see there's this chest in this closet. And that is the chest that I talked about earlier. That's this chest here, the chest of bones. And this chest of bones leads into a quest. Um, remember I told you that, that the bones of Leo, you know, he is the bastard son of Strahd's father. And this woman, Silva, who is a Vistani from the Vistani camp at the Tesser Pool. And nobody knows how he died. The only people that know how he died is Lady Valker, the matriarchs of the Valker family, and Strahd. And his bones are in this chest. The, the village, the encampment of Vistani in the Tesser Pools, they are heirs. They are relatives you know, distant relatives now, generations later, of Leo. They always look to Leo as 
This was the Vistani's camp way into the nobility. It was the bastard son of the king, Strahd's brother, and he, he died mysteriously, disappeared. They think maybe he died on a hunting accident. If the players find the book in the library to tell the story that I told you at the beginning of this video and find these chests of bones and return them to the Vistani in the Vistani camp of the Tesser Pools, the Vistani will be overwhelmedly grateful. And they will be mortified as well that Strahd, on Strahd's orders, had Leo killed. And the Vistani at the Tesser Pool, who are the relatives of Leo, will share with the players their greatest secret. See, the Vistani at the Tesser Pool encampment knows something that nobody else knows. And that's a secret entrance into Ravenloft. See, at the base of the pillar of the big cliff of Ravenloft, at the base of the pillar of Ravenloft, there is a secret cave that's very hard to find that only the Vistani and the Vistani camp at the Tesser Pool know about. And that cave leads to a uh, cut, stoned, winding stairwell inside the pillar rock. And it comes up in crypt number 24 within the crypts of, of Ravenloft. So it is a secret way of entering in Ravenloft totally unawares. And the only way the players will find out about this secret entrance are from the Vistani in the Tesser pool. Now, you may wish to, earlier in your game session, as the players are going through the Tesser pool encampment, getting their cards reading, drop some stories about Leo and Leo Strahd's bastard brother, who was a great hunter, uh, disappeared in a hunting accident. No one knew what happened about him, but this is their, at the time, this is their uh, admiration and their feeling of connection to Ravenloft and the Strahd family. One of the reasons they feel loyal to Strahd was Leo was part of Strahd's family. So there's this kind of uh, f sense of, of relation there. There actually is a little bit of bloodline relationship there. So you can imagine how horrified they are to find that Strahd had, uh, on Strahd's order, had Leo killed. Uh, and so when you bring back the bones in the book, that's why they revealed their greatest secret, is the secret entrance to, to Ravenloft, which only they know about. So that's the value of what these bones are. And I have the DM notes here about it. And we'll learn more about it from the book. In fact, let's go over to the library and talk about that. So if you enter into the library here, which is upstairs, remember Ernst has never been up here. The only other person that comes in the library would be a maid or Halleck or Lady, Lady Valker. And so in the library, here, there are a couple of books. Uh, one of the books you're already probably familiar with, which is The Court of Ravenloft. This book has the name of all the members in the court that are tied to the crypts in Ravenloft. There's a DM notes with the crypts that they're tied into, which it adds some interesting color and history to the, the names that are on each of the crypts. Um, and this book can be picked up uh, in the bookstore and some other locations here. So it's, it's rare, but uh, it's a book that was in print. It was The Court of Ravenloft. It's a very old book. However, one book that's unique to the location is the history of Lavina Walker. And that was a story that I told you earlier. This book tells you about her poisoning Leo, becoming a minor noble on Strahd's order. So if you take this book along with the chest of bones to the Tesser Pool of Vistani, and share it with them, you'll be welcomed into the Vistani camp uh, and they'll share the secret. Now, there's even a clue here a little bit at the bottom of the book. It says, to this day, no one knows whatever happened to Leo. It, uh, it, it remains a mystery. His mother, Silva, was from the Vistani camp near the Tesser pool and died of a broken heart, never knowing what happened to her beloved son. So this is this is the story that will, will that you share with Vistani with that chest of bones it will change everything. Um, maybe even make some of the Vistani bring them over to your way of thinking, your player's way of thinking. Um, there is some cats in here. I kind of changed the cat encounter. I made it 1D4 plus 2 cats. If any players try to remove books or remove stuff from the libraries, the cats start howling and pestering them, which will bring the attention of Lady Valk or Halleck or somebody to the room. So it's not going to be a, a cat fight encounter, which seems like what's kind of written in the rules. I thought that was kind of silly. There is an entrance to a secret room right here. Um, let's check out the secret room. There's a door right here behind the bookshelf that slides open to this secret room. And this is one of Lady Valker's most important rooms. So she has the bones that she must keep protected. If those bones are removed, by the way, that's her tie to stride. That as long as they're protecting those bones, 
the family is protected by Ravenloft. So those bones are important. That's why they're in the bedroom. Uh, obviously, the urn is her most precious possession. And everything else that is of value other than Stella is in this room. And let's talk about what's in this room. So this secret room has a chest in it with a, with a lock on it. The key to that lock is always with Lady Valker. It's a DC uh, 15 to pick it. There's some gold pieces, some straw coins in there, but there are four interesting items in here. The first item is the dragon pipe. It's a pipe made of bone, and it's a dragon claw holding a dragon's egg. And what's interesting, if you investigate it, it's made out of real bone. In fact, it is the bone from the dragon Argenbost, and it was made as a gift from Strahd to give to Lavina Walker. Now, what's interesting is if a player smokes from this pipe, it will transport them into a dream state to Argenvost Holt, the manor of Argenvost of old. And so they'll be in a dream state. They will see all of Argenvost as it once was during its, its time when Argenvost ruled, uh, and that was his manor, Argenvost Holt. What's nice about this dream state is you can get a sketch or draw a sketch if you want to of the floor plans of Argenvost and give it to that player. So the player will remember the floor plan of Argenvost Holt as it once was. So it's a neat little uh, thing for the players to have and they'll, the, the player that smokes the pipe will be able to see what the floor plan is of Argenvost Holt. So that's kind of a cool thing to have. It's kind of also fits into the whole, you know, Strahd killing the dragon and, and, and the, the Argenvost skull and now also the bones of Argenvost in this dragon pipe. In fact, you might want to weave the dragon pipe in as a way of giving it as a gift to the revenants in Argenvost to, to help them as a tribute, help them you gain entry into the vaults. We'll talk about that when we do the Argenvost module. The second thing here is a deed in a map. And the deed in the map, uh, and this is rules as written, so Strahd had given the Valker family lots of land uh, this land is just north of Vlaki along the east edge of the Lake Zarovich. And this is important, this data map is important in the game because this is where Lady Valker is building her skeleton army uh, on this land that she owns that's outside of Vlaki. And when the time's right, she's going to have this horde of skeletons come into Vlaki and lay waste. We'll talk about that in a bit. The other thing here is something I got from Reddit. Uh, I actually had the Reddit link in here, a, a fan -made, some fan-made content called The Devil We Know, and it's, it's a bunch of text about, for the cult, why they worship Strahd, why they see Strahd as the, the, the person that they should believe in. Um, technically, the, the feeling is this. Uh, if we pay our loyalty and, and, and pledge our faith to Strahd and the Dark Powers, the Dark Powers and Strahd will therefore protect us. So there's some kind of weird twisted logic in it. We play to the evil and therefore evil will protect us. We pledge our faith and to the evil and therefore the evilness will protect us. And that's this kind of twisted logic loop that kind of feeds this whole cult. And this is one of the, the booklets that the, the, the members of the cult have. Um, and there happens to be one in here, and this is this is that there. So it's kind of interesting little uh, text that the players can can read. Last but not least, I put a big treat in here. Now I don't know if you're familiar with the dungeon uh, dungeon master's manual, but there's an item in there called the uh, the uh, the book of vile darkness, and I think this is a really cool artifact item. And when I was looking through. Um, the Dungeon Master's Guide, I thought this would be really cool to have somewhere placed in Barovia. And so what I did is I just reskinned it. There's a book reference in rules that are written, but it doesn't really tell you what's it, what, what's it about. So I reskinned it as the book that's in there, and the players pick it up and it says the contents is a foul manuscript or whatever, but really it's the Book of Vile Darkness. So this is a really twisted cool artifact treasure it has some major minor benefits and major minor detriments to the players it's just a really cool thing and, and i've reskinned it with a different name so the players who might be familiar with the book of vile darkness won't know what it is so i just put that in there really cool item for the players to find so this is a nice treasure room it'll probably be difficult to find but between the dragon pipe and the Book of Vile Darkness, the deed and the maps to the location where she's, she's creating her skeleton army, as well as the, 
the, the cult text, all of that is here in this treasure room. So this is a very cool treasure room. Last but not least upstairs here is we have Stella's room. And I already kind of told you the story of Stella. This room is locked. It's kind of in dilapidated shape. Stella's gone mad, kind of thinks she's a cat. Uh, and she's gone crazy. She's Her mother is trying to groom her into this darkness to become this dark magic user, to be a leader of the cult. She learns this horrible story about her family murdering her great-great-grandmother, murdering her lover. And then she witnesses her mother murdering her father. And so that just snapped her. And if you use greater restoration, you can cure her. But when she comes to... She'll know everything. She'll share with the party everything that she knows, and she will want to escape. Now, if the players help her escape, Lady Valker will hunt the players down until, until she can't anymore. So if you want a reoccurring evil villain for your players throughout Barovia, make another enemy of your party, kidnap or help Stella escape because Lady Valker, all she's going to want is her daughter back. She's going to make that her myopic focus and to kill and torture every person that was involved in helping her daughter escape. Um, she will have her skeleton army, her cultists, Ernst, Halleck, anything that she can reach out to to, to wield, uh, wield an attack on her players. Now, if the players uh, find out that she's Stella is mad and say, hey, we can cure her, Lady Valker will play. She's a master manipulator. Oh, you can cure my daughter? Great. I, I would love to have your help, but I, I need something in return. And she'll try to win the players over at this point to the whole Burgermeister's the bad guy, and he's, he's torturing people in town. He's ruling with an iron fist. You know, look at my manner. I've, I was a, a, you know, a, a minor noble family, and he's even kind of taken from me. We're living, you know, she'll play this kind of pity woman game, and if they can help her daughter, all the better. Uh, but when they help her daughter and they bring her to, she's going to be very careful because she doesn't want her daughter. She's got to win her daughter over. She might have to figure out a way to charm her daughter or, or threaten her daughter by killing the father because she needs to win the daughter over. That's her, her primary, th that's her number one treasure is Stella. Is, is she's, Stella's got to carry on the family. So that's it for the top floor. Let's jump down into the stellar. So the cellar is where all the cult action is going to take place. A couple of interesting things about the cellar. There's two entrances to the cellar, as I mentioned before, from the ground floor, from the coat closet or the storage closet, the servants. There's an entrance here. Players may not find it. They might come from this outdoor entrance right here uh, into the cellar. And they're going to notice this cellar. There's, it's a dirt floor. There's some tracks that are leading to this wall over here. There's four cots in the lower corner. Now, what happens when the players enter, um, you're going to have some skeletons rise up through the muddy floor, 1d10 plus floor skeletons, and begin to attack. Now, there's some important things about these skeletons that we should touch base on. Number one is these were the first skeletons. These are bodies that were stolen from the graveyard in Velaki, and Lady Valker used some of her dark, dark magic to learn how to create these skeletons uh, to not only protect the cult, but later she realized, I'm going to make an army of these skeletons to rain down this horde of skeleton army to, to attack the village. So these are some of the very first skeletons that she created. It's going to be 1d10 plus 4. They'll rise from the ground and attack the players. Now, there is one way they will not attack the players. And let's talk a little bit about the cult, because this ties the cult in here. So as I mentioned before, and I'll bring up, there's a little cult text I put together here. Um, and there it is. So the cult, we know about the cult uh, text, the devil we know booklet, it talks about what they believe. Their basic belief is this. Remember I said they're going to believe in Strahd and the devil pay, pay, pay uh, pledge to them because in their twisted logic, the Strahd uh, and the darkness will protect them. Well, they believe in this rapture. There's going to be the day when the dead will rise and, and lay waste and kill everybody who's not faithful to Strahd uh, and, and, and to the darkness. What's really happening, the, 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 the vast majority of the cultists, other than the handful of leaders, the followers, uh, uh, don't know this, but Lady Valker is building that skeleton army on that property that she owns outside of Balaki, and that army is going to march in. The horde, just like the skeletons in this basement, will attack 
uh, the villagers, they're going to be focused on trying to get the Burgermeister and, and Isaac, but they're, they're, anybody that gets in their way, they're going to kill. Now, what she has said is, is if you're faithful in the cult, faithful to Strahd, faithful to the darkness, you will be protected. The, the dead will not attack you. In truth, she's created two amulets. Lady Valker's created two amulets. You have the amulet here for the, 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 the disciples and the followers, and then you have the amulet for the, the masters, the, the leaders. Now, the amulet for the disciples, the followers, she's given this amulet. Her sons, both her sons have this amulet. Ernst has this amulet. Stella has this amulet. Anyone that's an ally of Lady Valker receives this amulet and all the disciples of the cult. What happens is when the skeletons come, they will not attack you if you're wearing this amulet. Now, nobody knows that. The, the people of the cult believe it's their faith that keeps the skeleton and the undead from attacking them, not the fact that this magic amulet keeps the skeletons from attacking them. There's the master amulet. That there are only five of them. Lady Valker wears one, and then the four leaders of her cult wear them. And the master, again, protects them from the skeleton, but it also allows them to command the skeleton. So the, right now, they're going to have orders to kill the, the Burgermeister and, and any guards that protect him and Isaac. That is going to be the, the focus. And so as the, the horde comes down, they're going to focus on that. So if you have this master amulet, amulet, you can command the skeletons that are around you. If you have just the disciple one, the skeletons won't attack you. So if you enter into the basement and you have one of these two amulets, you're wearing them, the skeletons won't rise out of the dirt and attack you. You won't even know the skeletons are ever there. They'll come up out of the dirt. So that's why none of the cult members ever see the skeletons, because they're wearing this amulet. Now let's talk a little bit about uh, these cots. Why are these cots in here? Well, when you are initiated into the cult, the leaders of the cult, Lady Falker, want to make sure that brainwashing has taken hold. They're not going to let you come in and, and take the initiation ceremony and go, go back home. There's too much risk that the, the brainwashing hasn't taken hold and you might tell Isaac or somebody about the cult and that's, too, that's not good. And so the initiates are forced to stay here in the cellar of Lady Falker's home until she feels or the leaders of the cult feel that the brainwashing's taken hold, that they are truly loyal to the cult, to the blade of truth and to darkness. So this is kind of this initiate period that they stay here and they're not allowed to leave. Food's brought down to them. They have these buckets under their bed. They poop and pee in this bucket. They are brainwashed, you know, kind of almost like a Stockholm syndrome here in this cellar until they become fully devoted to the cult. Now you're gonna notice that uh, on the muddy floor, there's these footprints to and from this wall. And as you've, if you get close to the wall, the players will notice the secret door. They won't have to roll perception for it. If you're five feet away, you'll notice these footprints go to the wall and you'll see this secret door. Open this secret door takes you into this room. And there's a pentagram uh, there. There's five seats. And you'll see four cult fanatic leaders there. Now, one of these is Halleck. He's got his cult robe on. He's got his cult mask on. They're all in there. And the, this doesn't turn into a combat encounter right away. The, the, when the players enter, uh, these people are doing a ceremony, and then they will engage, speak with the players. What are you doing here? And they will try to initially convince the players that their cult is serving a good purpose. We are trying to rise up, and we have to meet in secret, because we're trying to overthrow the Burgermeister, who's evil. He's torturing people, and he's running these festivals. He's, he's taunting Strahd. And, and the only way to convince people is we have this cult to convince people. You know, So they, they're going to try to talk their way out of this and try to persuade the party that what they're doing is the right thing, that the, the Lady Valker should rule and, and take Burgermeister's place, and, and the people will be much happier. The, the, the cult members will only attack the players if they're attacked or if the players decide to leave and the cult members don't trust the players, they think the players are going to leave and maybe go tell the Burgermeister or whatever, the cult members will attack. Now, the way the combat encounter works is two things first. There is a percentage chance that 
The fifth seat is taken by Lady Falker. And you can roll the die. You can roll a 1d4 and on a 1 she's there. Or you can roll a d20 and have some kind of percentage chance that Lady Valker's here. And there's a cult ceremony going on. And she'll be there as well. And Lady Valker is a powerful magic user. I've also given her uh, the, uh, the Dagger of Venom. Um, she has spell casting and some pretty, you know, she has fireball, uh, wall of fire, fire shield. She has a lot of fire spells on her. She's a fifth level uh, 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 magic user, firebolt, mage armor. Um, and these cult fanatics are, are also fairly tough. They have multi attack, but they have spell casters too. So they, they can inflict wounds, hold person. So it, it's, it could be a pretty good fight with, with her. Now, there's another creature here. There is a uh, imp that's invisible. And the imp here, oh, there it is. The imp is invisible. And the imp will only materialize if Lady Valker's there. And the imp will protect Lady Valker at all costs. Anybody that's attacking Lady Valker, the imp will attack. Now, the imp is something interesting. The imp is actually Strahd's eyes on what's going on in the cult. Lady Valker does not know this. The imp is actually a, a scrying mechanism for Strahd. Strahd can see what's going on with the cult, keep tabs on what's going on on the cult. He can double check to see if Lady Valker is still loyal to him. Lady Valker doesn't know this. She knows this imp is here um, and stays with the cult. Uh, the imp is loyal to protect Lady Valker, but is also secretly loyal to Strahd. So that's the imp's role in this. The imp will remain visible unless Lady Valker shows up. If the players attack, there's any action going on in here, the visible imp will not materialize, will tell Strahd what's going on. Strahd will see this attack with the cult members, regardless if Lady Valker is there or not. The imp will be scrying on behalf of Strahd. So he has eyes on what's going on in here, which is dangerous for the players. Now what happens in this combat encounter, by turn three, uh, you're gonna get these here, these disciples. And the disciples are just regular cultists. They've got low hit points, they got a single attack. Uh, they're devoted to the cause. You're gonna have 1d6 plus three disciples show up. They'll be coming down these stairs here and they will begin attacking as well. So you could end up with four the four cult leaders, which are fanatical multi-attackers with spell casting, and have anywhere from you know seven to seven to nine, six to nine uh, cult devotees show up. They, I mean, they only have nine hit points; they're not super strong. But you know, now you're getting into action economy is something to think about. So this could turn pretty pretty sour pretty quickly. So. That's what's going on in, in the basement. Now there's one other thing here is when they go into the room uh, in the basement, uh, hanging there is the Blade of Truth. It's floating in the air. And the Blade of Truth is an item that Lavina Walker had found. It's just an ancient dagger. It has no magical properties, just an ordinary dagger. But she has cast spells on it to an illusion on it to make it seem very powerful. It's floating, it hovers in the center of this of this, uh, this room here. It is the, the physical symbology of the cult. This, this dagger has this dark power and it's through these illusions and spells that Lady Valker convinces cult, ma uh, cult members of the power of darkness, right? If you look at Lady's, Lady Valker's stat block, which I've included, a lot of these illusionary type spells, you'll notice that she has mage hand, light, uh, minor illusion, all these types of spells to create illusions. She's using these spells to convince new members of the cult or initiates the cult of the power of darkness. So this floating dagger, this dagger of truth, uh, the, the, the blade of truth is, uh, is the symbol of the cult. It floats, it hovers in this room through magical powers. The reality of it is just a normal dagger. Now here's the fun part. If you use an Arcana check of DC 20, do not, do not tell the players what the DC is. They say, we want to check it for magic. Say, just roll an Arcana check. The higher they roll and fail, meaning if they roll an 18, 17, 18, 19, just tell them this. It is super dark, super powerful. You need to attune to it, but it is a very, very powerful 
weapon of darkness. A lot of dark magic, magic surrounds this, but you'll need to hold it and to attune to it to learn exactly what it does. That's on a fail. So the more successful they think they are, the more you need to lean into this kind of super powerful dark magic. And it'll be really fun. The players will think that's a super powerful item. They'll be trying to figure out how to use it. They'll be afraid to touch it. I mean, it, it, it is some fun role-playing experience. Just whatever you do, just don't tell them what the, the DC check is. Now, if they roll over 20, uh, then you can say, well, it has this illusion of, of magic. Now, you can make the DC higher, or you can just make it so high that they can't pass, and you can have this is just kind of this fun uh, role-playing session where they, they assume that it's super powerful. Which player is going to attune to it? The player attunes to it, nothing happens. Maybe they have to do something with it. I mean, this, this dagger could be a, a, a running gag <laughs> throughout the campaign where they're trying to figure out maybe they keep it with them and they're going to try to use it against Strahd. But it's just a normal dagger. The, the players will never figure that out if they never pass that Arcana check. So it's kind of a funny thing to, to have in there. In there. So let's go to the last uh, thing in here, and that is uh, the the skeleton army. So you you know about the cult, you know about the family history, you know about Stella, uh, all of that stuff, the Blade of Truth, the books, the quest uh, to go to the village, I mean the uh, the Vistani at the Tesser Pools, and learning about the secret entrance into Ravenloft. Well, there's a big encounter. How does Lady Valker take over the village of Velaki. Well, she has this army of skeletons, and I said it's probably, you know, 40 plus D20. You can make it between 40 to 60 of these skeletons. These, by the way, are just uh, normal skeleton uh, warriors here. Uh, you can give them different various weapons. You know, you can give them short, short bow, crossbow, whatever you want to. Just use a regular, just the regular skeletons. And she's raising these skeleton army on this property that she owns outside of Velaki. And the skeletons are going to march when she feels right, march into Vlaki, and they're going to, and the, the crowd, the, the, the villagers are going to go crazy. It's going to be total havoc as an army of skeletons descend on Vlaki. Now, the skeletons don't care about the villagers. She's commanded the skeletons to find the Burgermeister, Isaac, and anybody, guards or anybody that stands in their way, to kill the Burgermeister, to kill Isaac and to kill any of the Argards loyal to the Burgermeister. Now remember, anyone wearing the amulets, whether they're the Disciple amulets or the Master amulets, the Leader amulets, the, the, the skeletons will totally avoid them. But it'll be just a crazy situation. Now, as soon as the skeletons dispatch, if they are able to dispatch the Burgermeister and Isaac, well, Lady, the skeleton army will disappear. And what will happen? Well, this will uh, validate the entire cult. You remember, the cult believes at one point the army of the dead will come and destroy the non faithful. So this just reinforces what the cult believes. It validates the cult story with the other villagers. And Lady Valker says, You know, my family for years have been saying this army is going to come. We should pay homage. And you notice that none of the cult members, the people that believe in it, none of them were hurt, none of them were attacked by the skeletons. And so it's a way to, to win over the people of, of the town. And she can, she can further play into that. The skeletons came because, because of these festivals, because of the Burgermeister and his flaunting his power and disrespect to, to Strahd. The, the dead did come. So, uh, and Lady Valker can take power at this point. Now, there are three ways that you can run this encounter. You can run it off screen, meaning that the players leave Velaki, they go maybe to Kresk or to the Wizard's Tower, and then they hear about it, or when they come back, they learn that Lady Valker's now in charge, the Burgermeister's dead, uh, uh, Isaac's been killed, or Isaac's uh, on the run, and, that's, and the, the army of dead skeletons came and just disrupted the town and, and killed the killed the, the Burgermeister and his, his allies, and now she rules. So you can do this totally off screen if you want to. But there's two other options you can run. Uh, we do have two really cool modules. You have the town square module with a great map of the town square. You also have the streets of Vlaki. Uh, you could also use uh, the stockyard map and you could just run this with just hordes of skeleton and have a kind of a crazy combat encounter where the skeletons are running around. You have some villagers running around. You also have those wearing the amulet that the, the skeletons aren't attacking. Maybe the players don't know about the amulet yet and they're trying to figure out why aren't the skeletons attacking not attacking these villagers, but attacking these villagers. Like something's going on. The skeletons, maybe they can def 
you know, decide what, what's going on with the skeletons. So you could have this kind of multi-map, street map with the skeleton, you know, big horde army, and just have a really good time. You know, run real simple encounter, combat encounters. I, if you're going to do that, if I had a big skeleton horde attack, I would make all the skeletons one shot. Like if you if you if you land a blow, you kill the skeleton, and you can create an, a skeleton army of a hundred, right? So they're marching down the street, and every time you hit the skeleton, if you land a blow, you don't roll damage dice; it's just a kill, right? Boom! If I hit, it's a kill. So it's a fun way that you can run really fast combat with lots and lots of hordes, and so you know each skeleton gets a single attack, whether it's a crossbow or a sword, and your your guys can. You know, as long as they land, as long as the the spell hits, or as long as the blow hits, you don't even roll the damage dice. They're just the skeletons are one hit, one shots. It'd be really fun and crazy to run. It'd be, it'd be crazy. Option three, perhaps the players are at the Burgermeister's home and they've allied with the Burgermeisters against Lady Valker. You could have the skeleton army ha take siege on the Burgermeister map, so the players could be in the Burgermeister's mansion. And all of a sudden, the skeletons surround the mansion. They start attacking the mansion, and the players either have to try to escape or pack the uh, uh, um, um, deal with the burgermeister. When I put the burgermeister's map together, I'll probably put that encounter in there as an optional encounter. Sort of like if you watch the um, the village of Barovia, I did a similar encounter where each window had a number to it, and you would roll during the combat encounters to see if the wolves were entering the burgermeister's mansion in the village of Barovia. So you could do something like that as well. So those are the three options off screen, just a big horde army running through town, running amok, or you could do the siege at the burgermeister's mansion. So that's it. That's it for the Walker house, the cult, some magic items, some backstory, a quest that takes you back to the, uh, the Vistani camp and learn the secret entrance into Ravenloft and the huge skeletal army attack. I really hope you you like this guide. Please make sure to hit subscribe and like if you did. If you're interested in being a Patreon member, the link's down below. And until next time, this is Parm King signing off and may all your roles be critically successful.